in the den of iniquity Vicinity no pretty Calamity if he hit me any moment What's a pity? Tomorrow never certain What was behind the curtain? The face of evil stricken With that shifty eyes averting It's not a steady bubble Cut either pop or topple Many will fall and stumble Let the dozers gather rubble From a later Colorado Guinea to the King of Faso Cannon could reach the towers And the troops will storm the castle He I say Run, run, come, we we get it because the peace that is bestowed upon the meek is overrated So run, run, come, make me get it Calling all your data, and your sons, we can't forget it I say, run, run, come, make me get it Because the peace that is bestowed upon the meek is overrated Lord, run, run, come, make me get it Calling all your data, and your sons, we can't forget it With the rubble steady rising And hearts are compromising Conditions here are stifling Making evil appetizing The fists are steady forming And Tenants is falling, defenses are withdrawing, possibilities are falling. In these circumstances, evil will make advances. Pick up your sword and lances and be sure to take your stances. Victory is never promised. The battle is upon us. Gather the brave and honest and the righteous in your corners. Yo. 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 So, 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 how's it going, Dr. What's happening, man? What is happening? Can indeed? you hear me? Are you hearing me loud and clear? Uh, I, I'm hearing you, you very hear well and nice and clearly. Are you getting any echo? <laughs> I'm not getting any echo, no echo? sir. I, I think I all think we're right. doing good. We're, Do you we're, hear any... we're, doing, we're doing all right. <laughs> doing all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Indeed. We already got somebody in the house. We got one audience member right there. Right there. It says hot beat. <laughs> Indeed. Hot beat. So, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, wokeness, wokeness, wokeness. Now, this particular topic was inspired by a conversation I had on Dr. Thunder's channel on Sunday. Yes, Sunday. And we talked about the Dave Chappelle situation. And I believe, Dr. Thunder, you titled it Get the Bag and Then Speak Truth to Power. So wokeness, 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 wokeness. What is the problem with it? Why would we want to cancel it? And then how? Okay, over here, this is getting ish done with Ike and Dr. Thunder. And we're going to tackle the question of how to go about addressing the whole wokeness problem. But first of all, we'll start about why exactly is it a problem? Okay, some of us find it aesthetically unpleasing when we find a lot of people are green on something and you cannot question it and so on and so forth. You know, there's a saying that, hey, if you go somewhere and you ask on a particular position, 40% of people agree with it and 60% disagree, that's democracy. If 99.9% .9 of people agree on something, that's North Korea, right? So that people <laughs> should agree on something is something that is patently uh, false about human nature, right? The best you can get when you give them a certain amount of freedom, again, democracy, even with all the controls and so on and so forth, you're going to get like 60-40 at best on the issue, right? When you get 99% agreeance, when people say, hey, this is a sacred cow, you cannot say this, this goes against the dogma, right? You cannot say that the earth goes around the sun because, hey, they're going to come for you, right? They're going to come for you. So what I'm going to start us out with, Dr. Thunder, is a clip by my man, John McWhorter. Are you familiar with John McWhorter, Dr. Thunder? Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. okay, John okay. John McWhorter and, um, of course, his uh, frequent uh, uh, contributor, uh, collaborator, uh, Glenn Lowry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The Heavy black dudes, guys man. on on Blogging Heads. Yeah, so on we're going to play heads. a clip from... <laughs> right, right. <laughs> We're going to play a clip from John McWhorter, okay? See here if our clip player thing works, right? And over here, he's talking about his analogy for wokeness, ladies and gentlemen, just so that we can wrap our heads around what exactly do we see it as? What exactly are the problems with it, okay? He uses the religious analogy, right? I already talked about the fact that, hey, you cannot say that the earth goes around the sun because you know it's against dogma and they're going to come for you so it is similar to what we have today where you cannot ask certain questions if you talk about black on black crime for example you're a bigot right 
<laughs> Ain't that right, Dr. Thunder? You're a bigot. You need to be ran off the stage. Mm-hmm. You're dangerous. You're a dangerous person. You're saying bad, bad, bad things. You have a bad heart. You're not. You need to step to Jesus. You, we need, you need corrective measures. Uh, of course, the problem with this particular religion is there's no redemption. There is no step to Jesus. There is no confessional. There is no, there is no hope for you, right? You need to be canceled. You need to be banned. You and your generations after you, because of the generations before you, and all that kind of crap. You get the picture, right? So yep. that's, uh, I don't know if you had any comments before I played the little clip uh, from John McWhorter here. Yeah, and history itself is is uh, is tainted. You know, uh, if you go back in history and say, you know what, it sure was better in the 50s. Uh, marriage rates were higher. You know, less out of wedlock birth rates. You know the all of that. All of that stuff was great. Lower abo- abortion figures. No abortion, hardly. You know, it seems like that that was better. Oh, you you know you just you know, oh you're advocating to, you know to go backwards and X Y and Z. No, I'm just looking back and saying, hey, you know there were some things that were were positive. And we sort of got rid of, we got rid of some things that maybe we shouldn't have gotten rid of. Yes, I can also say it's better. <laughs> it's better today as far as freedoms that black folks in particular uh, enjoy. Uh, I can say that. I can say that there's less uh, racial animus and all of that. I can say that. That's definitely the case today. That's better than it was in the 50s. But, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So, appropriately, you know, in a discussion, in the conversation of this manner, as I was alluding to, we're going to go ahead and try to define our terms. Now, wokeness being a particular kind of cultural phenomenon, you can't just give some kind of uh, definition for it. (laughs) Easily, what I mean. So, you want to go through, what does it look like? What does it do? All right. When you go and poke wokeness, what is the reaction it gives you? Okay. So the gentleman asking the question, right, that I placed there on the chat. What we're going to do now is we're going to spend the next few minutes asking, what does it look like? What happens when you poke it? How does it react? And again, for the purposes of this conversation, we're going to use the religion analogy because it is like a religion. It has sacred cows. It has dogma things you're supposed to say, things you're not supposed to say. It has original sin, right? Such as being white, for example, right? Where you're just, you're already, you are in a privileged group. Forget being white. Let's say you're tall, right? Let's say you're, whatever it may be that may be seen as an advantage that puts down someone else and you're not putting down this other person by any action of yours. It is, there's nothing you can do about it. That's why it's kind of like original sin. So we're going to go with this analogy. We're going to go down this line and uh, we're going to see what Mr. John McWhorter has to say about it. And then we'll offer our comments. We have a religion in that there is scripture and there are questions you're not supposed to ask. And there is original sin. And so, for example, there is scripture. The scripture says that America is based on racism and that racism is what America is all about today. Now, those aren't indefensible positions, Fair but use. we're taught now to treat those things as scripture. And so, for example, if someone like ta Coates at The Atlantic writes a piece called A Case for Reparations, and the main point is to indicate that scripture that I said, then the piece isn't engaged at this point What people like about a piece like that, who are members of this anti-racism religion, is simply that it was said and they're hearkening to the proclamation. So the idea that you're supposed to engage or ask questions, or some people might even want to be skeptical, that's considered incorrect. It's considered heretical. Now, this is not a knock. Okay, okay, okay. So let's take it one step at a time, Dr. Thunder, right? So... The heretical thing, the, hey, I have a dogma and you're not allowed to say anything about it, okay? The, why we're using this analogy is because this is, a, this is something that we can easily point to and be like, hey, I recognize that pattern in human behavior, right? 
I don't have to go scratching my brain talking about the history of social justice. I don't have my brain and talk about the, um, what was that German school from which all this kind of postmodernism started from the Frankfurt school, right? Uh, go yeah, back right. and start from Friedrich Nietzsche and then the Frankfurt school. And then uh, what did Foucault have to say about it? It's like, okay, well, let's just chill, right? Let's just say, hey, can we at least recognize that there's some similarity with, with, within what we call wokeness with this, I have a dogma, I have this sacred scripture. I like to proclaim it, not so that it becomes challenged or questioned or rationally engaged with, but I proclaim it and that is it. That is the sacrament. That's 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 the word for the day. We've read out of the Holy Scripture. And how dare you say anything about it? Would you say that so far, John McWhorter is on the right track? Yeah, definitely he is. Uh, I've done he, I think he's done a uh, masterful job of providing a particular, um, I mean, the analogy fits. Uh, and I've heard him speak on this topic at length. And, and even do debates where this was a central topic. Um, and he's very clear. And uh, I, I have a hard time f finding anything that I disagree with, uh, with respect to, you know, the way that he has framed this whole woke thing as a religion. Okay. So as is our as is our way here, <laughs> I can't help but immediately start poking back. <laughs> um, <not for> the... <laughs> okay, because some of us don't like wokeness because we are contrarians, right? <laughs> I'm speaking for myself. Uh, contrarian is a shorthanded caricature of what I'm saying, but basically we like to push ideas all the way through the logical end. We're, we're, we're students of philosophy. So whenever you say, hey, this is where the discussion stops, we know you're lying <laughs> because anything you learn from philosophy is there is no end to any of these discussions, right? You can never stop a conversation. Mm. That's the whole lesson of philosophy, right? You can start from premise back to conclusion again, and then realize that you only were within a certain frame. And if you expand the frame, you need to change the premises, go to a different conclusion, so on and so forth. You can keep, keep on creating these different bubbles, think of them as little Venn diagrams of concepts intersecting, moving, so on and so forth. But you never say, hey, this is definitive X, Y, Z or anything. Never. So when someone says, hey, there's a pattern of behavior called wokeness and it is, it is akin to religion, I want to, and maybe we'll not address it right now, maybe as the conversation goes on, I want to say, hmm, why is it there? When is it appropriate to have sacred cows that you don't say anything about? When is it appropriate to, and for whom is it appropriate? Because I always like to make that distinction too. Maybe it's not for everybody, but is it the case that everyone can speak from my position of privilege to say, hey, we should be philosophers who never, you know, always question and question and question. Dude, some people are brain dead, right? <laughs> to keep it simple. I, mean, I don't like, I don't really like using the whole brain thing as a, as a proxy for how people operate, but people understand that, that at least, right? That, hey, not everybody's going to be thinking to begin with. So how dare I say, I, hey, I, that there is no there is no space for I, dogma I, I think, and I think I have an answer. I think I have an answer. I think the answer is to the point of your satisfaction. So that answer is a variable answer. So it applies um, not with the same measure to to all. So if some are brain dead, maybe they don't ask any questions. But if someone is capable of asking the questions and, and honestly needs some, some answers, then uh, they're free to, gotcha. to, to question to the, to the point of their satisfaction. I see. I see. So if it takes me, let's say me for, I just described an extreme. My extreme is infinite, right? I'm going to ask questions forever. <laughs> there is no stopping <laughs> There is no stopping the conversation. I don't I, like it. Just no, 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 no. I don't want to hear about it. Like even the conversation we're going to have, uh, Dr. Thunder, about the good, right? Uh, the good things. Even when we get to some kind of platonic height of, yes, this is the good. I know that's not the end of it. <laughs> we might end the show that day. But another day, I may want to frame it differently and say, okay, cool. 
how about if we look at it from this perspective? Because there's always the aesthetic perspective, the political perspective, the ethical mm. perspective, right? Mm. Which of this thing, which we've called the good, pure, objective. But then how does it fit into aesthetics, politics, actual people's lives and how they live, right? Because again, people are different in their capacity to engage with different things. And I like how you put it in the sense that to the degree to which you are willing, able to engage, on to your satisfaction with a topic, you should be allowed to ask questions, right? And if you're yep. able, if, if, if you stop at a certain point, then you stop there. But if somebody wants to push the boundary further, don't go beating people over the head saying, hey, how dare you ask, you know, hey, aren't black people killing black people? That's not, you know, no, 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 you can't say that because racism, because you're, you're working against the, uh, the other people. Now, another question for you, Dr. Thunder, and, and it will continue, is... You talk, we're just put it on the, on the realm of our rationality. I'm saying that there's something anti-rational about this kind of a religiosity. When you bring religion yep. into the realm of discourse, there's something anti-rational about it. How about the question of organization? How about the question of being on code, right? You may see what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. In the sense that, hey, if you start saying, asking these kinds of questions, you're undermining the movement. Somebody said in the chat about anti-racism taking stock of the racist policies from the past that are leading to particular outcomes now, which we cannot deny, okay? Things have consequences, yeah. right? And if you were to question too much, Mr. Ike, the philosopher, you're going to ruin everything, right? It's like, we're going to put you to death, just like Socrates. <laughs> what did Socrates do? He was charged for corrupting the youth of Athens. Why? He was asking too many damn questions, right? It's like, hey, Socrates, stop upsetting the apple cart. We have a political yeah. program. It requires unity, and we need to just agree and move forward. Stop with your BS philosophy. How about that? How about that aspect? Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I was watching uh, The Angry Man earlier today, and he's doing. He was doing a stream. What was the name of that stream? Uh, something about. Um, Oh, uh, basically, black folks don't ever have any money. <laughs> and uh, so, so one thing he was saying was, "Oh, I lost my train of thought." What was the <laughs> what was the question? What were we talking about? <laughs> Being on code, right? Being on code. We've been talking about anti rationality, uh, and then somebody uh, may say, "Hey, rationality is all cool, okay." But at some point, you need commitment, and commitment has nothing to do with the rightness oh, or okay, wrongness okay. of your actual position. Well, okay. you got to commit. You got to just yeah. toe the line. Uh, okay, so, uh, so he was making the, uh, the a sort of distinction between praying, because he said, you know, he's a religious person, or he said he's spiritual. That's what he said. And so he was saying that, you know, sometimes praying is not the, you know, that that's not going to solve your issue. Sometimes you have to actually do something. So if we take praying as the sort of, uh, in this example, as sitting in the place of philosophizing and the action moving in a particular direction uh, in the place of doing, uh, then I do think that there is time, there, there, there's a time and place for both of those actions. And um, I think so long as you have satisfied, that, that you are sufficiently satisfied to move in a direction that's what may be necessary, but you still have to actually do the moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. The, mm -hmm. the thought won't do that for you. The praying won't do that for you. It's the actually moving in a direction that will actually start to get ish done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So interesting, interesting, interesting. Many things have been said here. Uh, someone asked is, uh, the contrarian path, nihilistic, which I would say is the, the philosophical path. Is it nihilistic? And I would say that uh, 
if you have the correct, there is a particular definition of the word nihilism, which is the correct philosophical point of view of nihilism. I would say yes, that philosophy is dangerous. In other words, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, people say, hey, rock and roll music is bad. And then here I am now coming a green. <laughs> Like, whoa, 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 Ike, I thought you were, uh, you know, you were, for, you were a modern man. You're about freedom and so on and so forth. Yes, I, but I understand the dangers. Philosophy is dangerous in that it leads to nihilism. Well, this is why. Go ahead. Yeah, well, this is why I like the, uh, the Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. Because uh, especially through the, you know, the, the whole Catholic thing is to not sort of reject uh, intellectualism or science because those things are not in opposition to faith. Uh, so if you consider the fact that uh, faith, the word that is translated as faith or confidence or trust often in the new Testament is the Greek word pistis and pistis is a legal term. It's a legal term that literally means argue to the point of belief. So we're not talking about a blind leap. We're not talking about a risk with no reason. We're actually talking about something that seems to have weighed the options, struggled with the options, and then made a decision that seemed to be, you know, beyond reasonable doubt. 100%, 100%. And it's in line with what you said earlier, to your point of satisfaction, you need to be able to argue, yes, right, <laughs> to the point of belief. And that point of belief is your point of satisfaction. The reason why philosophy is dangerous, as I was saying earlier, even though I advocate for it, and I am one, I am a philosopher. Yes, I said yes. That. Mm -hmm. but it's dangerous because it's like, it's like taking a tightrope walk, right? It's dangerous. If you want to, if you're that type of person, go do it. But would you tell everybody, Dr. Thunder, to be a tightrope walker? No. <laughs> People mm -hmm. will fall. They will lose their way. They go crazy, right? They read Nietzsche and they say some stupid, they start thinking stupid stuff, right? It's like, uh, well, for those of us whose point of satisfaction never ends, where we're going to keep on asking questions, we're going to keep on doing your pistis thing forever, right? That's just kind of our way. It's like you ask Jordan Peterson, does he believe in God? And right there in front of you, he doesn't, he's, he's thinking. He doesn't want to answer the question, right? And I, I always use that analogy because I'm just that way exactly too. I'm right there with Jordan Peterson where it's like, oh, what are you, what, what, what are we talking about here? What do you mean? Because we're not in the, we're not readily in that realm of, I'm going to stand with you, solidarity, let's move forward. We both believe in God, so now what's the action plan, right? That kind of a thing. We're not very comfortable right. with that kind of thing. So we're always wanting to examine the text, examine our perspectives, examine what exactly we're participating in, and so on and so forth, right? So let's continue with the – go go ahead. Yeah, let me just make this last thing. Uh, St. Thomas, uh, also referred to as Doubting Thomas, uh, takes a lot of – uh, he takes a lot of licks. Uh, he seems to be the a particular favorite whipping boy uh, because you know he he wouldn't just believe, right? And he, but to his defense, and I tend to be this way. He stated what it was that he required for his belief, and then. His allegiance to the point of martyrdom. So he, he he established what it was. He says, "I have to put my fingers. I have to be able to put my my finger through the hole in his hand, in in his side. And if if that is satisfied, then I will believe." The first scientist. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> and it, it, and what's 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 interesting is he he takes flack, but most of the time people are unwilling to say what their requirements are, and or they don't even know what they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
he at least knew what his requirements were. And then when, mm-hmm. and then when that was fulfilled, followed through to the point of death. So 100%. that doesn't seem too bad. 100%. To 100%. Yes. After all the rationality of empiricism, it just seems, seems like a contradiction there, but empiricism is, is saying basically, or the rationality aspect of empiricism is to say, Hey, what has to be true or what evidence can I give to shake you off of this pedestal you're on this belief you have? Okay. Like you said, Okay, then the guy says, okay, if I can put my hand through the, ha- uh, the hole in his hand, my finger through the hole in his hand and on his side, then I'll believe. If you show me this particular data point, then I'll believe. If you show me these premises leading to this particular conclu- conclusion in some kind of syllogism, then I'll believe. That is the way rationality should work. You should always be asking yourself the question, what is it out there that will take me off this perch and constantly looking for it? That's why it's about invalidation. Scientific method is not about proving anything, in case uh, some of us don't know. Right? You're not trying to prove anything. You're looking to disprove everything. <laughs> right? Hence the mm. whole faith, doubt thing. You, you get back to faith and doubt. But let's not, to, let's not get to Soren Kierkegaard and all that other stuff right now. <laughs> let's go back to my man, John McWhorter. On Ta-Nehisi Coates and what he wrote, right. it's the way the work is supposed to be received, and that also goes a couple, couple steps back. And again, let's just refresh or... our memories as to basically that John McWhorter here is using the religion analogy to explain the wokeness thing. Because we're going to say, hey, where does or what does wokeness consist in? What is the milieu that we find it in? How does it react? What do we do when we poke it? Because it's a complex social mechanism. All these kinds of social things cannot just be given a simple definition. But we can look at them analogically. We can say, hey, there's something religious about it. There's something whereby there's sacred cows, sacred dogmas, original sin even. Uh, but this particular religion doesn't have any kind of salvation, which is the problem with the religion. The religion would be cool <laughs> if they said, hey, you know what? We, we, we are for, we, you know, hey, you have original sin, Mr. White Man. You have original sin, mm-hmm. Mr. Privileged Person. You have original sin. Uh, some people even say, you know, the female, female privilege, for example. We are in the manosphere mm-hmm. after all. So some people may say, hey, you know, the, the women have had all this privilege all this time. And now they have been emancipated from some of their responsibilities, let's say. But they still want to hold the privilege side, right, of it. Yeah. Um, and therefore, now they're bad people. <laughs> but if you were to give people the ability to say, hey, come to Jesus, if you will come to an understanding or come to some kind of um, repentance and we'll, we'll welcome you with, o- with, uh, with open arms. And that'll be uh, uh, the redemption side. This particular re- religion doesn't have redemption. So John McWhorter is talking about the religion of wokeness, a view to take to look at why it is problematic to rationality and other things. Or some people might even want to be skeptical. That's considered incorrect. It's considered heretical. Now, this is not a knock on ta Coates and what he wrote. Right. It's the way the work is supposed to be received, and that also goes for his current book. And I didn't think it was. I thought that you, the way you did it was just as a, start, as a starting point, because it Fair was. Enough. You said it, when this book came out, and many people had written things about reparations before. Very much. It wasn't that different than what many people had written, but this mm-hmm. was seen as gospel. Yeah, I was genuinely perplexed because I just thought, reparations less than 15 years ago, we kind of already went through this, and yet there was this reception. And also, we all know that reparations isn't going to happen in any real way, and yet there was this reception. And that's when I realized, wait a minute, it's that he's preaching, and there is a community of people who are taking in the preaching. And why I call it preaching is because there's a sense in this religion that if you ask questions beyond a certain small point, then there's something wrong with you. There are things that you're supposed to just allow. And so, for example, apart from what ta Coates has written, suppose somebody asks, and I'm noticing that people are asking this a lot lately, why is it that the black community is much more upset about one white cop killing a black man or a black woman than the black men who, for various reasons, are killing one another at alarming rates in our cities year after year? Why is Can we, can, can we stop here? Now, if you ask that question, then you're given. And I stopped. Okay, so, and actually what I wanted to refer to is something a little bit earlier, uh, maybe about 20 seconds ago. But but 
okay, so I think for for a particular context, because McWhorter has a particular view of religion that in a sense I would disagree with. Of course, mm-hmm. he himself is an atheist. And so he's sort of, uh, he has his reasons for sort of questioning religion. So the way that he is describing, uh, uh, the way he's describing religion with these sort of uh, questions that you're not allowed to ask, I do think that there are versions of religion that are that way, I I would say. But I would also say that that may be a flaw to whatever that kind of religion is. Are you saying that basically he's doing the whole Sam Harris thing where Sam Harris is going to go argue with Jordan Peterson about religion, right? Rather right. than Sam Harris use a definition of religion, a kind of understanding of religion that is at a Petersonian level, he keeps talking about mm-hmm. the Russian grandma in the rural areas and yep. what she believes right? and how she thinks about scripture and blah, blah, blah. Oh, ho, ho, ho. is it, you know, in other words, the right. caricaturing, the straw manning straw man. something. Yeah. So now, okay. now I, I I would argue that it it may be the case, and I certainly experienced this when I was growing up. Uh, in the kind of church that I attended as a as a child, that when I became of age and started asking certain questions, I certainly did get the pushback and the "you're not permitted to ask those questions." You need to, you know. Uh, toe the party line as it were. Uh, but I ended up leaving that church because I didn't find answers that I required for uh, sustaining uh, this, you know, this faith, this relationship with God, whatever, however they were describing it. And um So, yeah, so I'm just, this is a, this is a, you know, this is, it's a fine point. It's a, it's a nuance. Um, I still think that his argument works, what he's saying works, because uh, the same flaw uh, in the religion that he speaks of, uh, it's also a flaw in uh, the sort of woke uh, anti-racism sort of movement. I too want to address something and let me see if I can pinpoint point it down here and then I'll say it half answers. Somebody will say that there's a difference between. So it's about what he said when he said, Tony Hasi Coates writes something, even though people know it's not going to happen. And even though people have had a argument about it two years prior, now he writes it in a certain way and people accept it. Not because they think it's going to happen or because yeah. it's bringing new arguments, but because it's a, it's a eulogy from the pulpit, right? Now, right. let me see. People are more upset. Now, if you ask that question, then you're given a white cop killing a black man. Let's see. What's wrong with you? There are things that you're supposed to just allow. And so, for example, apart from what ta Coates has written, suppose somebody asks, and I'm noticing that people are asking, do you have people who are taking in the preaching? And why I call it preaching the is preaching, because there's a the sense we all know that reparations isn't going to happen in any real way. And yet there was this reception. And that's when I realized, wait a minute, it's that he's preaching and there is a community of people who are taking in the preaching. And okay. Why- so now this is where I'm going to I'm going to ask the question, <laughs> because I think that uh, for oh, uh, uh, I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> I, I, I have an idea of where you might be going so it's based on where you stop let's keep going interesting 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 um i I may not be going there because i i'm I'm just going to stick with the aesthetic point because i think that the aesthetic point is what's central here to this where the way i see it in the sense that the tanahasi coats of this world and the preachers of this world the the lyrical people of this world i hey i'm one of them okay i'm out here putting words out there Beyond being the philosopher type that I described earlier, I'm also the poetic type, right? I like I, I write songs, right? And when I write songs, mm-hmm. I'm not trying to make arguments, okay? 
I'm trying to move you. I'm trying to get you to say amen, right? I'm trying to get you to say, mm. yes, run, run, come, make me get it, whatever. Like, oh, whatever, what are we getting? Yes. Is it worth it? Yeah. No, we're not asking questions. You don't ask questions about what we're getting. We're going to go get it. That kind of a thing, right? So yeah. I always, now, there is an issue when you blend these two things together. And I think that the argument that John McWhorter is making is that, hey, there is a space for religion, right? There is a space for rationality. Don't bring those two together. It caused problems because, hey, if somebody needs to hear a ta Coates speech or writing and, you know, needs to be elevated in that way, right? They need to hear something from Malcolm X. They need to listen to an Ike track and get all hyped up, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Again, we're in the realm of the aesthetic world. These things are written okay. rhetorically for effect. They're polemical uh, at best. They're not meant to be rational treatises on some kind of philosophical topic. Now, generally speaking, though, in the modern world, okay, there has been a blurring of the lines between these things. As long as there's words on a page, then it's just words on a page. You know, who are you to say? Who are you to question that, you know, that way is the right way, the wrong way? In other words, the things that we have said, the lines that say, hey, rationality is supposed to be about disproving biases. And so they're like, hey, 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 that's just phi logocentric white man type talk. It's all power. Who gives a crap? So what I'm asking now is this point, if you may comment on it, Dr. Thunder. Do you see the need? What about the need for the, the cult leaders like myself and our proclamations and our songs that we write that people want to dance to and so on and so forth? How do we draw the line between, hey, dance to the songs, but hey, it's not a philosophical work, right? Yeah, this is this is interesting. Um, all right. So... Uh, sort of art um artistic uh something where you intentionally are embellishing things uh things are made larger than they actually are uh things are uh what is it uh you know smaller than they appear or bigger than they appear in the <laughs> in the mirror um uh, objects may be you know uh, abstracted by, uh, you know, the concave or the mirror. Okay. So I think we, we know that. And, and also, uh, if you're trying to rhyme, uh, you may have to, you may have to give up, uh, a particular nuance or precision of communication, uh, that's really nailing a particular thing down, uh, for the sake of rhyming. Okay. I get that. And then comparing, comparing that to something that is, uh, a statement of actual fact, uh, something that can be verified and trusted, you know? Yeah. Okay. So maybe those th two things are, are, are different. Uh, but I also, I also happen to think that I, I don't know that that's a perfect analogy for the sort of difference between mm -hmm. religion and rationality. Um, I would argue that those two things are not distinct. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive categories and they're not in opposition. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas art versus science, as it were, those two things actually, in, in many respects, actually are in opposition. Because mm -hmm. they're not, well, maybe they're not in opposition, but they're not seeking to, to explain the same sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I like the way somebody put it here. Indoctrination and education to become intertwined. That is the problem, generally speaking, which hovers above whether or not you're talking about art versus science. You're talking about the um, the truth right. finding aspect of religion is the more let us bond and sing songs or whatever aspect of it. Right. And that um, Well, I mean, the purpose is, is, is clearly different. The purpose is clearly different. Um, mm -hmm. I, in, in the case of McPorter talking on this topic, um, he definitely has a biased and slanted 
view of religion as he is using religion uh, as a comparison for uh, what Tana as he quotes was speaking of with respect to reparations. He even says, um, you know, this is something that's not going to happen. And so then uh, by that, since anyone that is religious, you know, you know, they have to be somewhat foolish because you're sitting there and you know that this is going to happen, but you're just allowing this person to, to make you feel better based on things that cannot be, uh, you know, why, why, why are you trusting in any of this? So it's like, there's, that's like, that's like the sort of undercurrent that he's sort of getting in. That's the, maybe that's the river he's, he's sort mm-hmm. of floating his boat on. <laughs> yeah. There so is, there are, uh, so you, you're, you're like a closet philosopher yourself. I, I think you probably have the freaking degree to, to back it up. I'm just, I pretend that everything I do. Right. But uh, <laughs> I'm an amateur in everything. Uh, but but I, 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 I like, you know, the, the Olympics are amateurs. Right. You know, so anyways, uh, yay for amateurs. Right. Um, but that's right. That's you, right. The, yeah. The Olympics, it's not full time stuff. But, you know, we 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 do our stuff. We do our due diligence. Uh, one day we'll learn how to read music. Dr. Thunder. Don't worry. Um, the. <laughs> person who did what John McWhorter is doing in the philosophical canon at the highest level is Plato, where he said, hey, all that poetry crap, right? He came for all the myths, all the poetry, all the stuff. And he was coming at it exactly the same way John McWhorter is saying now, which is, hey, dude, this stuff is a whole lot of BS. And you guys tend to exaggerate a whole lot of things. Why is Aries crying on the whatever? Like, this is not what we should be exemplifying. He went through and he, he did not just say, hey, in some kind of abstract way that this is not true. He said the particular things that you guys are putting in these stories, I don't like. Right. So that's we may we may call him a Platonist in that regard. Uh, John McWhorter, that is. Uh, no, no he's a, he's an English professor, right? I, I think. he's uh, a, um, I Yeah, think, he's a linguist. Yeah. Yeah. It's a language yeah. Guy. Uh, what, which is interesting because his, his arguments are as if he's an empiricist right and empiricists tend to be um uh you, you could have an empiricist in in the arts also uh it's an interesting kind of way that you have to create uh quantities to you know so that things don't sort of fall fall apart in abstraction because uh, you're still analyzing art but there are empiricists in the arts and uh but it's it, but it's interesting because it, it seems that a more native uh, uh, discipline for an empiricist would be something in the STEM fields, not mm-hmm. um, not nece- not in in the humanities, as it were. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, he's over there in the humanities arguing like an empiricist. I'm over here. I'm a STEM guy, and I'm talking. I'm trying to say, hey, how about my cult? <laughs> <laughs> continue fair use why i call it preaching yep. is because there's a sense in this religion that if you ask questions beyond a certain small point then there's something wrong with you there are things that you're supposed to just allow and so for example apart from what tanakasi Coates has written suppose somebody asks and i'm noticing that people are asking this a lot lately why is it that the black community is much more upset about one white cop killing a black man or a black woman than the black men who for various reasons are killing one another at alarming rates in our cities year after year. Why is it that people are more upset? Now, if you ask that question, then you're given half answers. Somebody will say that there's a difference between people doing it from within the community as opposed to doing it as a figure of authority, but that's not a satisfying answer. You might have more questions, but you're not supposed to ask. Or somebody will, like Charles Blow, for example, will say that the people who are killing each other in these communities are doing it within a structure of racism. Now, that's a start, but you might want to say still, why are we more upset at the one white cop? You're not to ask. Now, of course, there are people who do ask, but when you ask the question, you're treated as if you've done something wrong. You've blown on a tuba in church. You're racist. You don't get it. You're not understanding the scripture. 
you're not with Jesus. That's what it is. You say that it's Here, it, 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 unlike, we gotta stop. We gotta stop. Religion, it's, you have, you must. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so this is this is interesting. Um, and this is the uh, I, I think Mc, McWhorter is super heavy, super killing in his conversations with Glenn Lowry. If if the folks uh, mm-hmm. watching, if, if you haven't checked them out, those two dudes are heavy. Those conversations they have, it's it's ultra bad. I mean, you you need to you need to do, do yourself a favor. Um, okay, McWhorter actually is a liberal. So that's another thing that is interesting because many of the arguments that he, he presents uh, are sort of, you know, mm-hmm. they've been sort of remarketed and branded as conservative uh, positions. Um, uh, I think McWhorter would, would style himself as uh, more or less a, what's, what, what some refer to themselves as being a classical liberal, Oh my God, um, that one. which Go more or less is, is what we would call a conservative these days. Um, mm-hmm. But, but he is a liberal. I mean, I think he's, a, I think he's pro-choice. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. there's a, there's a, there's a list of things that make him align him with uh, at least the center, but some things with more, more on the left, his biggest, biggest gripe like Bill Maher, who's also a liberal, is cancel culture, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and even um, uh, who was the comedian that that uh, we were trying to Burr, Bill Burr, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Burr Burr is a liberal. He he also hates cancel culture. So it's it, uh, though cancel culture t- tends to reside on the left. Uh, it's definitely of of the of the far left. It tends to be, uh, you know, moving out of that sort of uh, you know lo- locale, um, mobilizing out of that locale. Though that is the case, um, there are folks that are aligned on both sides of, of the aisle that seem to be equally opposed. Uh, I don't know uh, if you're familiar with the what, what's the uh, what was the name of that letter. Um, I can't think of the name of the letter now, but there was a letter where it was academics, uh, folks in, in the arts, um, all, it was a wide swath of folks that were, uh, some of them were conservatives. Some of them were center. A lot of folks were on the left. Um, and, uh, they, they drafted this letter to, uh, to basically state their uh, opposition mm. of, uh, a counter cult of, of cancel culture and saying that it was a, uh, a, a negative thing, a minus thing, um, and uh, counterproductive to uh, the idea of free exchange of ideas. Um, and if you, especially if you consider what the academy uh, was designed to uh, to accommodate, uh, having something like cancel culture as a uh, that's one of the places that it's most aggressive is on college campuses. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyhow, but, but McWhorter is a, is a liberal, but he's making these arguments, uh, that's, that sound like they're conservative arguments. Um, and you can hear the bias that he has against religion. And so I think that in, in a matter of speaking, aligns him a little bit more on the left. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can, you can, you can hear that in his uh you know in his in his line of reasoning but it's hard you it's hard to argue against the general assessment of what he's saying now here's a here's the main issue that i that i take with a a, a, a main issue that i take with a quarter so he raises mm-hmm. consistently this issue with black on black crime with uh you know why why is it that we're more upset with you know a white cop killing black person versus black fo- folks killing each other. Now, my response to that is I think all of it is abhorrent, but it's not that the media, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not that people in general um, uh, are more upset when a white 
person kills a black person. It's that there is a, an artifact and the artifact is back from times of slavery. When the slave master, the slave master would catch a slave trying to run away, kill the slave, take the slave's dead body, put it on their, on their porch, leave it there for days. So as, as an example, um, uh, if you get out of line, this is what can happen to you. Also, we see the same thing with lynching, right? So you leave the bodies up in the tree, in the trees. Sorry to be so graphic, but you leave the bodies up in the tree to, uh, for, for days as a signal. Look, you, you, uh, if you get out of line, this is what happens to you. My belief is that the reason that when a white cop kills a black person, uh, that it gets so much play in the media is that uh, uh, the powers that be are, are, are still asserting what the hierarchy is. Okay. They're saying, um, remember this. Now I don't know that it is conscious. I think this is a, uh, it's an undercurrent. And I think that we have a, an unnatural, um, you know, uh, this weird fascination with the mutilation of black bodies because it's been such a tradition and such a history in our country. So he doesn't mention any of that as a particular context mm -hmm. to frame this. And I think that that that's important. That's important to know. It's not just simply this cut and dry, simple issue of, um, uh, they're going overboard with this and see, um, uh, you know, they're, they're saying, uh, they're saying this because they're claiming that uh, racism that as you know, doesn't actually exist. It's not just that it's actually something else is actually animating mm -hmm. <laughs> is actually animating this whole thing. I mean, you, you the 24 hour news cycle, 24 hour news cycle of different angles of how <laughs> the, the you know the black person got killed. Oh, now this new <laughs> cell phone footage from the other side came out. So now we got to spend four more days of twenty four hour news cycle. You know, uh, you know to you know, <laughs> you know to examine the, that. The thing you bring up is rather interesting. It's it's a it's a very complex problem of uh, of uh, text and um, history. What I mean is story, what I like to call Storyville. When there's a storyline yep. that exists, right? It is, as you say, the animating, I like it like you use animating, the animus, the, the spirit, right? <laughs> yep. That thing you cannot get rid of. That thing is going to animate people. It's going to infuse itself into some particular, look, when the cop came up to the black gentleman, and in some case of a cop killing, probably wasn't thinking of history. He wasn't thinking about this spirit or nothing like that, right? Something happened between them, had to do with uh, license plate, this, that, or the other. He said this one day, uh, I thought he had a gun. Boom, somebody gets shot. That set of facts, so those set of facts have nothing to do with necessarily the history, but you cannot now separate the history from it. The storyline, as you say, the mutilation of black bodies from it. And then even the people who go around looking the, using their cell to get all you say they may not consciously be playing into this story or this history, but it plays into it, okay? And yep. it becomes a problem. And it, uh, it's something, it's a problem that the, the postmodernists point out very well in the sense that, hey, you rational people, you, you, the, you know, you pseudo rationalists out there, you're acting as though rationality is actually what's going on here. No, what's going on here is thousands of years worth of stories, thousands of years worth of stories that move people, okay? And if you yep. can control the history, control the story, Right. Then you can control outcomes. You can argue like Thomas Sowell. No, no, no shade to Thomas Sowell. But you can argue like Thomas Sowell till the cows come home. But ain't nothing going to change. Right. No. Uh, no, nobody's going to listen to you. Uh, yes, Thomas Sowell has all the rationality on his side. But the animating spirits are going to be there and they're going to move the masses. And Thomas Sowell in Stanford, uh, down the street from here, uh, Stanford and the Hoover Institute and his buddies, 
you know, discussing these things don't have any effect whatsoever, especially in the postmodern times, which I believe is absolutely 100% true. You too just said it. Yeah, that, look, these things have a life of their own. So, so far, you've talked about the free exchange of ideas, that us, that is, because we wanted to establish what wokeness is. And then we're going to move into how, okay? This stream is titled How to Cancel the Woke Religion, right? We haven't got to the how yet, okay? Because we have to talk about the what and the why first. The how then kind of follows from that. The what and the how. I mean, the what and the why. We've said, hey, there is a political aspect to this, which says, hey, the free exchange of ideas, your phrase, right? That's a political thing. It's, it's tied to democracy. Somebody could argue against it, but they're going to be arguing against it from the point of aristocracy or monarchy, right? Or maybe maybe like uh, some kind of the or is it theocracy, right? That says, hey, free exchange but, of ideas. No, 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 no. There is the one idea. And what's all this free stuff? And then there's the question of epistemology, meaning how do we know what we know, which is the whole rationality thing, right? You say, hey, this is an offense to rationality, right, on the one hand. And also it's an offense mm -hmm. to a political kind of order, which we find in modern times to be good, which is free exchange of ideas. But um, let's continue with John McWhorter and finish this out. And then we're get, gonna get into how exactly you tackle it, right? What do you do now if you are either, wh whichever side you find yourself, maybe you're against it aesthetically because you don't like people agreeing that much because it gives you North Korea vibes when you just have to sit there and shut up, right? Maybe you don't like it from the point of view of anti-rationality. Maybe you like to sit down there and discuss all the ins and outs with Thomas Sowell and John McWhorter. Or maybe you are somebody who does not like the political correct thing that says, hey, no free exchange of ideas because you're a staunchly democratic free exchange type person. But how do you handle it is the, is the next question. But let's continue. Must have faith. It's like someone saying in an argument when you're talking about uh, politics or whatever, you say, well, why is that? Because God said or because the Bible said there are just certain things that you just don't go and you you have to buy into that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, you are, are wrong. You're there wrong. are certain questions you are simply not to ask. Or if you ask them, you are treated as if you've done something wrong. The eyes roll. You are part of the problem. You are evidence that America doesn't want to talk about race and racism when I think you and I both know that we talk about it all the time. Yeah. The idea that anybody would say that is what I mean by religion. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that whole nobody yeah, talks about religion. racism stuff. Well, we, we need to have a conversation about racism. It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> if people talk about having conversations yeah, about things as though they actually have said anything. Like, we need to have a conversation about racism. Anyways, we're going to go ahead, okay, and see what else John McWhorter has to say about the woke stuff when it comes to... Let me see. The Church of Woke... The truth is... is we have to understand that you cannot reason with people like this. And it's okay. very rare that you teach somebody out of their religion. And this is a religion. And so Good. So he starts out with the whole religion thing again. And then he begins by saying, hey, you cannot talk people out of it. Now we're getting into the how. What do you do about it? So he's saying, hey, the first thing you do is don't think you're going to talk to these people. Right. Which leads to the it's kind of not in that whole question, that whole realm of why do you care? You guys are a bunch of lames anyways. Like, why do you care? what somebody thinks about what you said why do you care that they roll their eyes when you ask certain questions why do you care why do you care why do you care some may say hey you know my job is on the line or whatever it may be right but that's this is what we're going to continue from here now he is now going into the whole thing of well how he's getting practical practical he's getting pragmatic well what do you do so let's continue here starting over the truth is we have to understand that you cannot reason with people like this. And it's very rare that you teach somebody out of their religion. And this is a religion. And so to try to talk these people down doesn't work. All they know is that you're a racist and that's all you're going to get. So the idea is not to try to have a dialogue with them about these sorts of issues. You have to just shut down. But I think that we simply need to start telling people like this no. And the, answer, the question is not how do you stop them from calling you a racist on social media? You don't. That's what they're going to do. And it's time to start letting them do it and going on about our business and, you know, having our fellows around us, having our friends around us and just making these sorts of people realize that screaming that you are racist isn't going to get them what they want. They've learned that that strategy works. And so they're going to keep using it and they're never going to consider 
that it might not be the most humane or even constructive way of doing things. But we're, these are human beings, and all of us have that element. There's a Lord of the Flies element in these people, although they would never recognize it in themselves. And so we need to start telling them no. And I am working on how to get people to actually consider doing that, because I, I get at least three emails a day from people who are scared to death of the elect and understand that these demands don't make any sense and are, are destructive, you... but they need to keep their jobs or they don't want to get screened at. They have children, et cetera. Nevertheless, something needs to be done because these people will not stop and they're not open to reason. I just think my analogy is... Um, with sharks. I'm told, I don't know if this is true, but I'm told that you can bop a shark on the nose. I do not mean violence against these people in any way, but with these sorts of people, I think if you just said, no, I'm not a racist, and I don't care whether you put it on Twitter or not, and I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, and keep looking them in the eye, and don't apologize. If you do that enough with these people, they'll back down, but it has to be enough people doing it that a subconscious group awareness emerges among people like this, that just yelling dirty names is not going to change the world the way they're hoping. Do you feel, okay, so Dr. Thunder, what do you have to say about the bravery angle, which is just basically saying, hey, screw them, okay? You may have, you don't want people to scream at you. There may be some kind of chance that you may lose your job, which by the way, that's a very tiny percent of, percentage of the population that actually has to, worry about somebody canceling them from their job because of something they said okay most people are just scared and most people will go along to get along people are social animals anyways they don't like people to scream at them they don't like people to roll their eyes at them so what do you have to say about this whole bravery aspect which is hey you're gonna need to weather the storm say what you will don't give a crap what people say about you me for example i believe that for example okay my whole social media presence is me, my face, my real name, my real everything. You can just Google me and you can find out everything about me. Yep. And you can see, you can hear the things that I'm saying right now to you, right? So that, that's kind of like a similar approach, which is just put yourself out there. Don't worry about it. What do you have to say to that about a tactic for fighting against the woke religion? So one thing I, I, I find interesting um, and this, uh, and, and by the way, uh, back here, and here's a, let's see here, I've got a better view of it uh, right there. Uh, that's an interview I did with Minister Jap, um, and uh, that was a really good conversation. We, we mentioned uh, the Dave Chappelle uh, special, and, and then he did a, he did a show today and he, what was it? The 14, uh, what is it? The 14 folks that actually should get canceled. <laughs> uh, and it's all, it, it's all, uh, the, the, the 14 protected groups that should get canceled. That's what he, that's what he said. And, uh, so that was a, that was an entertaining, uh, it was a good show. And I also watched, uh, let's see here. It was the show with um, it was Green Gorilla. Um, he did a show yesterday, um, and uh, T. Uh, Doctor T. Son Johnson was on there, and uh, that was a show. And you know, uh, sh shout out to to Green Gorilla. He sort of coined a term, "white woman energy," uh, <laughs> because that's actually what's has uh that's sort of the animating force of all of this woke stuff it's these various groups sort of trying to nestle up and get close to uh the sort of fountain of of power and um uh, because if they can get close enough they will get that good white woman treatment and this whole thing started and green gorilla details this um, it started when, uh, in affirmative action, you know, uh, it started before that, of course, but if you look at affirmative action, 84% of the recipients of affirmative action, though it was designed to, to help black men, 84% of the beneficiaries were white women. So they figure out how to game the system and, uh, 
And then all of these other protected groups have sort of fallen in line. And, and that's, that is a, it's important to understand that. Um, and because the way, the sort of mode of operation is, is similar. The tactic is similar. So the cancel culture thing, um, the using fear as the way that they control you, that sounds a lot like an earlier tactic I mentioned about the body of a dead slave on the porch of the master's house. Not all of the slaves were killed. Of course, they couldn't afford to do that. But if you see one victim, if you see one that's been slain, you don't want to be the next one. And so it has been a powerfully mm -hmm. effective device. Um, and mm -hmm. again, as I was saying, playing these images of mangled black men's bodies over and over on, in, in media, it is a signaling of what the power structure is. It is telling you, you need to stay in line. And that is also what cancel culture is doing. It's the same tactic. It's the same tactic. But what you have to do is you just have to stand up to it. You have to be willing to say things. I mean, we did that show uh, that you, that you mentioned earlier, uh, we did that show, uh, uh, secure the bag, then speak to power. And obviously what was actually, you know, we were, we were begging that point. We weren't saying that was, <laughs> that's the actual answer. We are saying at every point you need to stand up and be a man. You have to be willing to address the stuff in your immediate, um, and it's in your immediate area. Uh, it's not going to be comfortable. You're, you're going to have, you're going to have, uh, strife and there's going to be stuff that's not ideal. We, we, we don't live in a perfect world. We, it's a fallen, it's a fallen world. So you're going to have to be willing and okay with, with dealing with that. And there's no promises. There's no promises that everything is going to go right. And, and, and say, say if you're able to secure your little corner of the world and all you did was just cower in the corner, that's not a life to live. That's not the, I mean, when I, when I get old, I want to be able to look over my life and I want to th think of my life like a, uh, you know, like a warrior looks over all of the battles that they've been through, through all the triumphs, all the struggles, all the things that you've overcome. Not that I was able to, to by, you know, use political trickery and maneuvering to cower in the corner and kiss butts. Mm -hmm. That's that ain't the oh. kind of story that I want. The kind of story, the kind of story. So you're, you're back to your aesthetic uh, thing again. But <laughs> let, let me, uh, first of all, I agree. A couple of things that are ancillary, tangential that are being mentioned in the chat. So I was talking about because the political aspect cannot be avoided. We've talked about it in the political and an epistemological aspect, you know, a rationality. What do you think? Rethinking, empiricism, rationality and all that kind of stuff. And then there's the po politics aspect. The politics aspect, one that needs to get practical. Now, with regards to what the, um, can you read what's on the screen and also the uh, the person over there, uh, the name? And by the way, uh, you guys need to drop those super chats if you want me to continue to read these comments, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, that's right. You know right. how this works? This is capitalism that we are operating that's under right. here, okay? Uh, facts. These fancy <laughs> lights don't pay for themselves. But anyways, what, 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 does, what does the person have to say? <laughs> that's right. If you want to see, uh, if you want to see, uh, what is it, Thunder 5D or 5D Thunder, whatever it was. I spent a while since I did it. Um, Cha-Cha Boy. The goal of a leftist is simply to 
improve the lives of others in the here and now. This goal has become muddied, however. Personally, uh, personal liberty is good, but, but you can't ignore the results and necessity of collective efforts uh, in achieving it. Too much focus on self-reliance and you suppress your most important tool, history. 100%. 100%. Agree, agree, agree. It's like one of those things. It's like, you know, um, the dichotomies. Oh, is it nature? Is it nurture? Oh, it's both, right? <laughs> uh, is it individuals or collective? Oh, it's both. Now, two things I'm going to mention here about this and then we'll move on. Number one is there's a difference between systems focus and the goal focus. The people who focus on goals and they tend to be more on the left. Let's just call it left. I'm not going to use words like liberal and so on and so forth. But the left tends to have a goal in mind. Like there should be no racism. There should be egalitarianism. They have a goal, right? They, there's this kind of a picture that they have in mind. And then there are some of us whom focus on systems. Now, the systems are directed towards goals, but we know the reason we call them systems is because we know they, they ain't going to get the goal. Okay. It's saying, okay, cool. What's the best system? Because I think that's when the left runs into trouble. They're very good at having beautiful goals in mind. But when you say, okay, how do we do that? Then it becomes an issue. You see, people whom are more on the side of, shall we say, uh, let's just say the right. What would be the right in this case? I put myself on the right in this particular, by this particular kind of thing. In other words, your favorite word of, uh, when describing me, sir, hierarchy, right? <laughs> hierarchy, <laughs> first and foremost, I'm never going to stray away from my love of hierarchy. So that puts me on the right, definitely, right? I'm a hierarchy guy. I'm a systems guy saying, hey, yep. your system is never going to get to your utopia, but the system is the best is the best thing we can do. What system do you want? Some democracy, some this, some that. Okay, we need to instantiate a system and let it run and understand that the system will never be utopia, right? And stop fretting that it's not utopia. You can improve and so on and so forth. You can infuse the individual spirit so that it can continue to uh, reinvent the system. You can continue to re-infuse the justice and the real purpose into the system so it does not get uh so that the order does not get too much it's the whole chaos versus order thing too i'm on the side of order in a particular regard especially when it comes to politics uh, i'm so side of hierarchy and on the side of systems goals are only just good for conversation right so right. that's one thing i wanted to just just mention there and then the second thing is when you're talking about any kind of balance in human activity, especially in political life, where you put the first stone matters. You're trying to balance something, okay? Individual responsibility or social responsibility. You want the balance, okay? You want it to be actually balanced, but the person who puts the stone first on individual responsibility and then puts the stone on, per, uh, on uh, social is 100% different from the person who puts the, the stone first on social responsibility and then puts it on individual. Even though after they have done their work, we see the scales balanced, right? But all the difference lies in what you do first, right? So I agree with the person 100% that both are correct, <coughs> but a great deal well, due to personality differences and also due to differences in thinking and actual positions and ways of being, it's going to lead you to do one first before you do the other. And that makes all the difference politically. And then secondly, there are, Systems versus goal is a nice rubric with which I used to, with which one can look at a lot of political discourse and say, hey, are you focused on the goal or are you focused on the system? You're never quite practical and pragmatic. The rubber has not hit the road until you have a system, okay? Because goals don't do stuff in this world, okay? Only systems do stuff in this world, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, if that is clear, and shout out, shout out, shout out. I think we got a super chat. We asked for one and we got one. What you got there, Dr. Uh, Thunder? Uh, new here. Uh, let's see here. Five dollar super chat. Uh, here you go. Great job, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, you know, one, th one thing that's interesting, one thing that's interesting about this, uh, uh, the right, if you're on the right, you're sort of 
putting that stone on the individual sort of responsibility locale first and then on maybe on the social thing. And then if you're on the right, on the left, then you're putting the social thing. But see, the thing is, is that I think that the, there's a bit of a incoherence here or uh, the, the dissonance or, uh, or, or an aspect of this that doesn't get discussed, uh, at least not with precision on the left. And that is that nothing would happen unless you first have handled something uh, individual to get yourself to a certain stage to be able to participate in whatever, you know, the philosophy is. And an example that came to mind, uh, so, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm, um, director of jazz studies at the university I'm at and I direct the top band. Uh, it's a big band. And, uh, I've talked to my band about what I call the three rehearsals. So the first rehearsal is personal practice. So you yourself must be able to play the music. The second is sectional rehearsal. So there's a trumpet section, a trombone section, a saxophone section, and a rhythm section. So each one of those sections will convene and rehearse the music. But that rehearsal will only go well if each individual did their work prior to that rehearsal. And then there's the third rehearsal, which is everyone together. So that's the full rehearsal, the large ensemble rehearsal. So that is when uh, each of those first two tiers, I said, or those two rehearsals, if they haven't taken place satisfactorily, then that third rehearsal is going to be a hot mess. Mm -hmm. So no matter what you do, you're still stuck with the uh, individual responsibility. It's just on the right, they will actually say that. Whereas on the left, you, you'll not hear folks on the left talk about that. Um, it's almost as it. if it sort of, huh? Although they are doing, they're, they're definitely doing it. Doing they don't it. Say they it. Yeah. Right, right. But because it, 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 it seems to undercut their argument. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. so uh, i that, that's why at the end of the day when i say left right and things like that and you know this and if you listen to my channel everyone knows this it's a philosophical difference now when i it, when it's political in the terms of political philosophy not yours your stupid uh, l little local politician or what party oh, yeah. blah 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 that's some bullshit we're talking about trans temporal things about human nature and some people, uh, there's a deep psychological part to this, and I agree with Jordan Peterson on this in the sense that people are going to divide themselves up into this group heavily based on psychology as well. And that there are people who just have that hierarchy and order psychology, right? In, in, a, certain, mm -hmm. in a certain regard, which is just going to be like, yeah, I like hierarchy. I like competition. I like all those kinds of things, right? But I don't, but I make sure I understand, though, that a big part of it is psychology. Like hierarchy is not written from the sky up down and say everything must be done my way. It's like, no, not at all. If everybody was like me, the world would not function. <laughs> okay. We would all be <laughs> locked in our caves and, you know, we would just be grouchy bastards. The world would not function if everyone was like me. Okay. We need the majority of people who actually are engaged with the, in the world of feelings, um, the world of uh, collective. The world where people ask questions like, uh, I think Leroy asked me if uh, my channel is geared towards um, black people. You see, th that kind of question makes sense to a majority of people, but not to me. So, <laughs> but I understand the need for those kinds of questions, right? Um, now, but to, let me answer that question, though. It's my, it's, my, it's my channel geared towards black people. Now, let me explain again psychologically that by now, you everything I've said would suggest to you that I'm not a group type person, right? psychologically. So it's the kind of thing I'm not going to emphasize. However, I'm an African. I grew up in Africa, grew up around a whole bunch of black people, came here when I was 17. 
understand. And now I've spent uh, over 17 years in the United States. Understand the African American kind of situation a little bit. So when you're going to talk about localized instances and examples and things to talk about, right? It's going to be coming from, shall we say, a black place. But this has nothing to do, you know, aesthetics is aesthetics. Epistemology, language is language. Epistemology, is human, human beings and the universe is what it is, whether you're black or not, right? And that is where I come in, in the sense that you're going to come up with these particular examples from your local situation, but really you're talking about things that are trans-temporal, trans-human, trans-everything, right? Um, not that kind of transformer, but uh, yeah. things that can uh, apply uh, all through history, all different kinds <laughs> of people, and so on and so forth. Because that is really where I dwell. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man of ideas. And whether you're, at, and there are men of ideas that are black, white, blue, or whatever, and to relegate us, um, and we tend to be the same way in this particular regard, and I'm sure you agree with me, Dr. Thunder, to say, to relegate us to a, is it a black thing? Uh, we chafe a little bit, right? We're like, uh, I want to talk about uh, both Plato and Hotep and this and that and the other, and who cares? You know, and I'm heavily influenced by, by the Buddhists too. My whole feeling, image, yeah, talk, I mean, meditation stuff. So, so like, where, where do I, am I going to say like, no, it doesn't, it doesn't really work when you start thinking. If you feel, if you want to feel your way through it, Oh yeah, then you go to church and you talk black. You know, you you're back in that church scene again, right? Where it's just uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a feeling black man. But when you think, you realize, hmm, no, I'm a human being in this universe, and that cuts across all kinds of crap that we want to put on label wise, time wise, context wise, culture wise, society wise. Man, none of those matter in terms of what <laughs> I am trying to do. But that's my <laughs> grandstand. Go ahead. Yeah, and I I want to uh, just point at a nuance. So, okay, so we think, uh, so you think about, you know, thoughts uh, in, you know, there's intellectual uh, sorts of folks, uh, those that uh, must perceive and understand what it is that they're doing, uh in a sort of rational uh, kind of way. Uh, and then you have people that we would say more feelings based. Uh, the, now, the thing that's interesting is that feeling yourself around it's, is still thinking yourself around because all of, uh, all of your feelings are in your head. They're just a different sort of thought. Right. So they're all thoughts. It's all stuff that is originating in your brain, but they're just different kinds of thoughts. Um, I think uh, folks will sort of, uh, I don't want to say demonize, but they'll certainly point out, out certain folks that tend to be more intellectual is you're unfeeling, you're on this, you're on that you know, this kind of thing. Well, no, it's not, it, 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 it's sort of a, it's kind of a contradiction in terms. Um, a person that is, uh, you know, a feeler is still a thinker. It's just the, the kinds of thoughts that they, they are entertaining are uh, what they call feelings. Um, so anyhow, I, I just I, wanted I will, to say that because that's a yeah. that's a that's a regular uh, that's a regular issue, and I think it be, creates a, a, a communication gap. It's... Let me let me raise it up a level by going to the Nietzsche point. And somebody else mentioned this in the chat. Someone said, even Nietzsche said to find truth from your body. So basically, here's what Nietzsche said, right, about thinking. He says even more complicated forms of thinking. As a matter of fact, he says, the more complex and kind of rooted out and top down and complete, in other words, philosophical your thought is, the more it is a feeling. <laughs> and no. when I say that, you can immediately say, yeah, I, I see where he's going, perhaps, yep. if you got some yep. intuition. But basically, he's saying, hey, there is a whole feeling associated with 
capitalism and free market. It's a feeling from the stomach. Okay. <laughs> and there's a whole feeling of the whole person who wants to follow the warrior ethos, right? Yep. He, he's coming from a feeling place. It's not stomach, right? It's kind of something else, right? In other words, that the big head thinking and the little head thinking, right? <laughs> that mm -hmm. those are thinkings. And the That's little right. head can write a book about why it is correct. Can it not? As a matter of fact, the little head has written many books. The big head has written yeah. many books. Stomachs and written, written many, many songs. Books. Oh yeah, the little head. The little head is responsible for many, many a song, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Also, uh, the heart, the the spleen, the liver. The, these different. If you look at master morality, right, the, the morality of King David, right, and what it's based on: conquest, lower end of Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, establish order, establish food, clothing, shelter, so on and so forth. Uh, get concubines. Um, that's a that's that's kind of a set of feelings, okay. And then there's the mm. saintly type feelings that say, hey, you know, turn your other cheek, maybe you want to do this kind of kind of thing, which are on the higher end of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Call it New Testament type stuff. Go ahead. I, I, I want to make this point, um, and this is a point that might have been better made in the show we did on Sunday. Uh, but you know, this we're sort of all sort of related, and you mentioned concubines uh i have been going back through and watching the hbo series big love and this is a really good it's it's a it's it's a good series um and uh it's about polygamy and it's it, it's it, it, and it's interesting because uh there are these sort of uh, ideas that that are circulating in the manosphere that you hear every once in a while. I saw a show CGA. Uh, shout out to him. Uh, did a show where he was talking about uh, how we're not really a, a monogamous society anymore. We've been polygamous for a long time. We just don't. Uh, we just haven't quote unquote legitimized it, but. That by and for, by far is what what's actually happening, right? Uh, we 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 talk about the Pareto principle, and um, if you look at um, how many men have procreated versus women, and um, you're related to more women than men, that means that the men had access to more women. There. There's, there's, there it is there. And now it's even extended. I mean, you look in a black community, you have something like 16%. Uh, Kevin Samuels uh, mentioned this 16% uh, of the men uh, have, you know, basically created baby mamas out of 80% of the women. Um, uh, so you have that, that thing sort of going on. So the polygamy thing really is what's happening. We just still are holding on to this mon monogamy thing. Now, um, something that happens in the Big Love series, which I think is very interesting, uh, and it kind of goes with this whole secure the bag, then, you know, uh, speak to truth to power. So there's this whole thing where uh, they live in Utah and, uh, you know, polygamy is illegal and they find a way to do it so that it's not bigamy you know they're not married to he's not married legally married to multiple women. he's married to one woman but then the others are also his spiritual wives and that's actually illegal also and so that they're they're scared to be public uh it's no longer really illegal but there's there's all of these you know judgments of other people and they don't want to get canceled basically you know and all this so, uh, so they're trying to acquire basically a casino and basically become independently wealthy. And then when they become independently wealthy, then they got FU money. That's basically what they try to do. So then they can be open with their polygamy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. 
-hmm. it's interesting that that is a, uh, uh, it's, it seems to be a, uh, we seem to be persuaded somehow that if we get the bag, that that will make all these other issues go away, that it will somehow, um, fill us with superhuman strength. And we'll be able to withstand any onslaught. Gotcha. But so we seem to have moved from the, the works. from the bravery to that whole idea of becoming untouchable, and then you become brave, right. which is yeah, which does not work for bravery. You're not brave anymore if you're safe, right? You're safe, and, and you're it in doesn't work. Security, and you're speaking up. Pardon me. It, and and it just doesn't work. Yeah, it, show it me where work. that's worked. It, hmm. I mean, even in the Bible, it says, you know, what is it? Uh, you know, you, you, what is it? Uh, responsibility or whatever in the little things, and then more mm -hmm. will be given, right? You have to demonstrate mm -hmm. that you're trustworthy with, with small measure before you're going to be uh, promoted mm -hmm. because. And for those who uh, cannot see the empirical kind of just sound reasoning and examples from their life just imagine that you're in a group of people okay and we talked about this on sunday uh, but imagine you're in a group of people okay and it's a go along to get along situation in other words maybe you're a polygamist maybe there's something you're doing that you cannot openly say you're scared of being canceled so you have to shall we say censor yourself right and you are coming up with these people they're your friends your lawyers your co-workers whatever they may be you grow with these people. No one is an island. So you become intertwined with them. So your whole being, to the degree to which you are a social creature, is going to be tied to them. So when you become big and you get them your million dollars, you're still tied to these people. You're not all going to all of a sudden flip and be like, oh, now I'm going to turn around and everybody and start saying stuff. It doesn't work that way. You already have to have been saying stuff from the beginning. That's Can I get nice. a one in the chat, ladies and gentlemen, if this point is clear? The whole point of get the bag or get to a particular situation and then you can speak truth to power never works because while you are going along to get along, while you're censoring yourself, you're forming bonds. Okay. You're, you're getting uh, possessed with all kinds of spirits. Okay. And also these things are external. It's not just in you. You're not just forming habits. Habits is one aspect I can talk about. Okay. These are bad habits you're forming. You can't just have these bad habits of hiding and not being brave. And then all of a sudden you're going to be brave. No, you can't have all these bad habits of, oh, I don't want people to roll my eyes at me. And then boom, all of a sudden you don't care that people roll their eyes at you. No, it doesn't matter how many millions of dollars you have. If you feel bad when you say the wrong thing, you're still going to feel bad. So hence, you don't go around going along to get along, forming social bonds, growing in the extroverted feeling world with people and then thinking that you're going to flip on them at some point. It, it doesn't work. That's that's the point here. So, no. um, and I think we, we've already gone long, <laughs> Dr. Thunder. <laughs> um, and we have not even finished the John McWhorter video. So really quick. Well, if you, if you gonna, want to try to, yeah, if you want to try to crush through it and then. Yeah, let's, let, let's play the rest of this. So far here it says, hey, just ignore them, move on, right? Don't no. pay attention to the fact that they're going to, tar and feather you on twitter so let's continue let's take a step back here and then we'll go just continue. yelling dirty names is not going to change the world the way they're hoping do you feel there uh, you know there is an objective way or an empirical way you were saying you, you can't reason with certain people which you know i think is true but what are, what are the factors that you point to to say you know what black america uh, which is a ridiculous abstraction to begin with, but is actually doing better than it was 50 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, one of the curious facts of the past year or so, or, or since, yeah, I mean, it's basically a year since uh, George Floyd. Um, we we have been, um, every every interaction that has gone violent between cops and blacks has been shown on, you know, network news or, you know, and cable news and everything ad nauseum. Um, yet the larger numbers don't seem to have changed very much over the past decade or even 15 years of the number of police killings of blacks, use... unarmed blacks or armed blacks, you know, or white, you know, unarmed whites, you know, armed whites, et cetera. What, what are the things that you point to to make a case for those who are looking for, you know, some kind of data to suggest, you know what, things are actually better than 
the way that we talk about them? Well, you know, I think one thing that's very important is to talk about just the whole police issue in general, as you just did, because one of the main, well, the driving factor in the idea that it remains a tragedy to be black in the United States is the relationship between the cops and particularly young black men. And I don't want to sound like one of these people who's, who's always railing at the mainstream media for having sinister agendas, but we are really, really misled by the mainstream media's obsession with showing the deaths of young black men while pretending that the same things don't happen to young white men too. So it's at the point where I personally see one of these horrible things in the news happening to a black man. And I think to myself, I wonder how many white men that happened to over the past five years. And every single time it turns out that that's the case. It's just that those cases didn't make national news. And that includes George Floyd. There've been you know, a white boy named Tony Tempa was killed that exact same way a few years before him. And so there's that talking about the cops, but also there. Yeah, check out Tony Temper. Anyone listening out there, there's a white guy killed the same exact way that uh, George Floyd was killed. Uh, interesting video. There's a very handy kind of um, mental picture that you might want to give people. If you took a George Wallace or if you took one of these Dixiecrats from back in the day and you reanimated them now and had them, you know, watch a laptop. I, I want to say watch TV, but I'm not sure what that is today. Yeah. Watch a laptop, you know, for a couple of days, drive around. That kind of person would have to pull over and wretch on the side of the highway, seeing how deeply Black people and Blackness have permeated all levels of this society. Strom Thurmond would be nauseated at the America that we have achieved today, even since his death how much blacker the United States has gotten. And that matters. That very much matters. And nobody could possibly deny it. Anybody who says that all of the civil rights victories were basically negated because of what happened to George Floyd, one, are not thinking about the fact that that same thing happens to, to white people as well, and we simply don't hear about it. And also that the country has come a very, very long way. And, you know, it's one of those things where, I am, um, you know, I'm 55, so I don't feel old yet, but I know that 55 isn't young. I worry sometimes this is going to be a little bit, you know, get off my lawn, but you have to, you have to say what you feel. There are people who are too young to understand what it used to be like, and I wasn't alive when it was really like what it was like, but I remember the 80s. I remember how openly racism could be expressed by some white people as late as the 80s. I remember not getting jobs openly Please. in the summer because I was black and that's it. I remember two cases like that where I could tell that's what it was and then <laughs> ask later somebody who knew and that's what it was. And yet, yet. They so, so far, pointing out that there's a lot of progress that has been made in this, in the, within the social fabric, right? You know, social black people kind of infiltrating the social fabric and so on and so forth. And this does indeed indicate a great degree of progress in the whole civil rights movement, if you will. And then to point out to instances which will always happen forever. Again, with the whole systems versus goals thing, people who want a have a goal of nobody should ever be killed, you know, no white, land, you're always going to have a problem. Right? <laughs> you know, it's never going to happen. Yeah. You, you got to look at a system that best enacts the kind of justice that you want. And within that system, mistakes will be made, bad people will still exist, and it's going to happen on black and, and the white side. And I'll continue playing it because I think you already touched upon earlier a lot of the things he's saying when you talked about the uh, and your beef with him regarding the whole police thing unless you wanted to say a quick word here before we continue yeah yeah let me just say a quick thing um so he he uh he makes a really strong point about how much progress that we've made okay and one of the things that is particularly aggravating uh, is just this idea that, you know, it's just as bad now as it ever was uh, when Trump got in there. Uh, um, oh, man, it's just everything has just, you know, regressed back to the, you know, <laughs> to, you know, uh, uh, to Jim Crow, you know just that kind of like hyperbolic uh stuff it's just it's hard to it's hard, hard to take that uh because 
in a manner of speaking, it sort of belies, the, uh, you know, the point that they're trying to make because they're not even willing to acknowledge where we actually are. Uh, uh, so to his point again, uh, you, you don't try to argue, you, you, you can say you disagree. Uh, you certainly don't apologize. Um, and then you just keep it moving. Uh, Mm -hmm. there's no, there's no convincing them of anything different. And they think that they are doing, uh, black people a service uh but they are not in in fact this stuff is making it worse for us it's making it worse for us and if they would just analyze the underpinnings of their own movement it's all animated by again shout out to green gorilla white woman energy <laughs> i like go. the white woman energy thing i like the white woman energy thing and uh also from a particular standpoint within the left there's something called progressivism to use a shorthand and progressivism is not about stopping anywhere right so you never acknowledge gains get right. the point <laughs> you never acknowledge. so you, so gains. you have goals so you have goals but then you don't acknowledge any gains. Yes, because you <laughs> exactly, and you 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 get the you get the you get the logic of it because it works. Yes, it works. Right. It keeps on. It keeps the engine strong. You you keep you keep on just you can get more money that way, right? Because this is real life power play we're talking about. Okay, if you want to raise funds, you're not going to raise funds of people by saying, you know what, we've made a whole lot of progress. Blah blah. No 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 no. Right negativity sells if it bleeds it leads you say hey it's horrible out here necks on the back of black uh, legs on the necks of black men all that kind of stuff that's the picture you got to paint that's how you're going to raise the money that's how you're going to get the airtime that's how you're going to get the bully pulpit that's how you're going to get things done progressive tactics shout out to saul olinsky um you wrote the whole manual for radicals <laughs> right um which and the, people come for him like though he was not just saying something practical it's like uh, if you want to do stuff politically and you want to be Machiavellian about it, in other words, you want to actually get it done, <laughs> no. then this is how you go about it. I'm not going to, he never said, oh, morality, this, that. It's just like, look, this is actually what's happening. And if you don't understand some of these things, even if you don't use them yourself, but you need to understand them. That way you're not going to be yeah. all confused uh, sitting around uh, talking to Thomas Sowell, like, why do people don't just get it? What? It's like, no, because real actual power politics has to has to come in. So let's continue with, our man, John McWhorter, laying it out here about how it used to be, progress that we've made, and how you should tackle the woke religion. Yes. The 80s compared to the 60s was like the, the second reel of The Wizard of Oz. Even then, there had been immense progress. But still, the way it is now, the, the browning of the culture, the very idea that everybody in the country is listening to young Black men bragging as their favorite music and loving the music as poetry and loving it the way people used to love Walt Whitman and Edna St. Vincent Millay. And that's not superficial. I mean, hip-hop is a religion, too. That's another creed. That being a religion that crosses races... These are unprecedented things. And yet you have a certain kind of person who wants to tell you that nothing significant has really changed since 1950 except manners. And that what shows that is George Floyd. No, that's highly childish reasoning. And unfortunately, the elect have such beautiful big words to express these things that it often sounds like they're saying something more sophisticated than they are. What, uh, what do you think undergirds, what, you what drives progress of the sort you're talking about? Because it's, it's you know, it's clearly happened. Um, but, you know, why, why did it happen? And can we identify that and thus either speed it up or make sure that it doesn't get blocked or detoured? We convinced the country that racism was a bad thing. A lot of very hard work was done in Congress. We tend to remember the people who did it for things like marches and speeches, but you know, Martin Luther King and his comrades worked very closely with people in power to make change happen. I think we need to start thinking about that. Now we think of it as activism to chase people out of their jobs for not using the N-word the right way. 
that's not something that I think King would have quite understood. There was that. And then there was a social revolution in the 1960s that I don't think we fully understand yet, where a significant number of people learn to understand that being a bigot is wrong. I think sometimes people lack a little historical imagination. Go to a cocktail party in your mind in 1964. If you watched Mad Men, look at those people. How would they have felt about how you're supposed to feel about a black person? They would have been all but unreachable. Something changed very quickly. And that is a wonderful thing too. And then black people were able to do what we were capable of once segregation was no longer in the way, once people didn't openly hate us just by seeing our faces as often as they had, we got to do what we can do. Now, there are still some obstacles. There is an inner city problem, as we used to call it. The drug wars, that was a problem. There are things that we need to get over. But the idea that America is all about despising Black people and murdering our Black bodies, that's fantasy. That's something from a comic book. And yet there are a great many brilliant people who are determined to make us think that we're supposed to base our whole lives on this cartoon vision designed for self-indulgence of both white and black people, instead of actually creating change on the ground the way the people who made a life like mine possible did. I think we're dishonoring the ancestors at this point. Well, uh, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, very, so, uh, go ahead. <laughs> so, a couple, so a couple things. So he, he says uh, something directly contrary to the point that I was making uh, about uh, this sort of artifacting uh, that creates a sort of unnatural obsession with uh, viewing the mutilation of black men's bodies. Um, he says something that uh, he, he I think he said that it was cartoonish. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, so of course I disagree with that. And I think that, um, given the if if you understand the history i think it's very easy to show um that uh that indeed is taking place i i just think also he doesn't understand fully the the uh you know the the animating forces uh you know as i as i expressed before this as i said before you know the original wwe Smackdown white woman energy. Uh, You're coming, you for, know, coming for Karen today. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. I am coming for Karen because Karen has jacked this whole society up. Uh, anyhow. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, so, so there's that. Um, you know, in general, I agree with this assessment. Uh, I do think that we could be more practical uh with some of the solutions i did want to address uh a bogarty's uh comment can you put that uh, one back about up? the about how to take care of the actual problems rather than just say well white people get killed black people get killed practical or, or which one which comment yeah so so the comment i want to deal with is uh is, uh, yeah so uh to use this tactic to focus off the top of saying, yeah, other people are going through it too. And that is the, uh, that's this, uh, that's basically the strategy that, uh, first of all, uh, WWE, uh, got it, you know, th that's how they got it started. Well, you know, it's not the, just the black people, you know, title nine, Hey, women too. Right. Okay. So now 84% of, of, you know, uh, of, affirmative action and all that goes to white women and okay so then from there uh you know i even hear black people frequently referring to the you know alphabet community as you know uh the new black people uh, so to speak and you know we need to be sympathetic to their issues and in x y and z and i'm not unfeeling uh and not unsympathetic but frankly uh i have become and turned into politically a black nationalist where the only thing I really care about is issues that benefit black men and boys uh, because those are the things uh, that are not addressed. They're never addressed. They're never addressed. And in my interview with a minister Jap, 
you know, but is the straight free thinking black man protected, but is the straight free thinking black man protected? And of course the answer to that question is no, the straight free thinking black man is not protected. <laughs> many things you said there, many things he said as well with regards to Jared's point as well. I think that um, the forums were discussing such things as, well, how do you police better? Um, I've seen people like MOT do it well. It tends to be pl places where people who have to have experience in law enforcement, right? And then they can say, hey, because as we know, to the degree to which any of us are professionals or, or, or operate within any kind of a practice, a career, ambition, whatever, we know that the intricacies or the particular issues are very unique that if you're not within that little thing, you, you can't really speak on why, you know, what the training is like, where the training is lacking, where are good examples of, let's say, municipalities or particular jurisdictions that have good training, right, that you can copy mm -hmm. and things like that. Whether it's schools or, in this case, cops and so on and so forth, we know that there are real practical ways for those people, again, who like systems, okay? And it's not just a left or right thing. But to the degree to which you want to actually look at the issue Jared is talking about, it's a systems question as opposed to a goal thing. It's, okay, well, let's look down at the system, right? Let's right. look down at how we train these people. Let's look down at how, what policing should be about. Should police really be handling all the things we charge them with handling? Is the job an impossible job? Why do we have all this? Why are they taking care of the mentally ill and your domestic violence call and your traffic it's like it's just too much maybe right these kinds of things that address things from a systems level which cleans out all the human garbage it cleans out all the story about whether it's a black body or a white body and it helps you just it just lays it down black and white what is to be done those definitely are conversations that definitely need to be had as well so ladies and gentlemen <laughs> If I can make this last point here, yeah. make uh, something point. And, uh, that occurred to 20 me. plugs too. Yeah, sure. Uh, something that just occurred to me, uh, especially in uh, in the clarity of your uh, systems on the right side, um, uh, uh, I guess progress on the left what was the what was the other what goals. was the you just have goals, goals they have a goal. right. yeah right so with thinking about systems on the right and goals on the left whenever you hear someone on the left railing against the system pointing at the system saying the system is racist it's the system systematic systemic racism you know that actually they're just speaking to their bias they're not actually it, it, uh, you know it doesn't actually mean anything they already see systems as an issue mm -hmm. so <laughs> so it's less about actually pointing out uh, actual you know atrocity or something that's wrong yeah. Or even something that they would desire to fix, they're just they're just stating obviously, <laughs> you know, I, I don't like systems because I'm on the left. They might as well be just saying that. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. I don't like systems because I'm on the left. I don't like the matrix because I'm on the left. And one thing that you need to understand is that you cannot exist without a system, without a matrix, without a border, without a definition nothing actually is a thing without any of those things. I don't care what you, what it is. You could call it a cup or remote control. This thing has a system, has a definition, it has borders, it has constraints, right? That's what we mean by systems, right? So a country, borders, language, and culture, yeah. right? Those are the systems, the borders, the constraints, blah, blah, blah. A thing does not have definition. As a matter of fact, one could even say it doesn't even exist in so far as we can interact with it, right? It might as well be like dark matter or something like that, that that just doesn't have any effect on any other thing. If it does not have any effect on any other thing, if it cannot be defined, if it does not have a border, if it does not have a matrix, 
then it doesn't exist. So this idea of I have a goal in my head, but I don't want any kind of a system, right? Uh, it, it, because I know that a system by definition is not going to reach that goal. It's only going to approximate the goal a little bit. Therefore, I start beating up the system. It's a perpetual game that you could play. You got to give them that, right? They got a nice little song that they can sing forever, right? Because you can always beat up on the system because there's always a system to be found. And the system is always going to be, it's always going to fall short of whatever goals you may have. So, it, Dr. Thunder, it's not honorable. We've been at it now. It's it, it's ahead. not honorable. It, it is not. Hmm. It's not brave. It's not honorable for them to point that out. It's not a sign of bravery at all. All it is is just um, a, a rock saying that it's a rock. Mm -hmm. That's one hundred percent. Something more than that. We started this out by asking the question: How does one cancel? the wokeness. And then we say, hey, why would you want to cancel wokeness? What exactly is it that uh, that's wrong with this wokeness thing? And then we looked at John McWhorter and he gave us the religion analogy. He says, hey, there is an epistemological problem, a problem of knowing, a problem of rationality and empiricism with wokeness because it says, hey, it is like a religion. It says you cannot say that the earth goes around the sun because that's against the dogma. You cannot say that ta Coates' book is full of shit because that's against the gospel. You're not with the, the movement, right? And no. just like a religion, there's the question of original sin, guilt, which you're just guilty of because you're in a privileged class. And for those of you who think, oh, privileged class is only the straight white man, well, you're in the manuscript, so you know that it's more complex than that. It could be any kind of man or any WWE. kind of other thing. And then if the white woman energy... <laughs> and also, I would even say that some people, to the degree to which their minds are twisted in the manosphere, put women in that privileged class and then start railing against them from that vantage point, right? And if you're using any of these tactics, you're committing a sin at the, you know, in the church of rationality and so on and so forth. But also there's a political problem in the sense of your, where you put it, you talk about the free exchange of ideas, Right. So there's an epistemological problem that this religion gives us. And then there's a political problem that religion gives us. You're supposed to just say certain things. Certain things are said for only aesthetic reasons. And we uh, granted, I said, hey, 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 I'm a musician, artist type, uh, whatever, right? Pontificator type. I like a little bit of zest and flower and so on and so forth. And I understand the need for that. When I sing my songs, I'm not writing my philosophical treaties. I want you to dance to them, right? I'm not, and hence... There is a space for the aesthetic rhetorical dances, right? And we need to, uh, if you want to read ta Coates' book that way as a kind of a, a, a book of poetry that makes you feel good, yes. But you should allow for the subject matter to be discussed, right, in a manner that honors rationality. Because otherwise, why talk, why talk right? So... We went then further into the question of how then to act. We talked about bravery. We talked about the fact that going, and the main thing here is that thinking you're going to be brave when you're safe is an oxymoron. You're not going to be brave when you're safe. You're never going to be brave. You were not brave in the beginning, so how can you be brave in the end? It doesn't work that way. You're not, it, these muscles, right, that you need to build, call it the bravery muscle, you can't spend years and years hiding it, keeping it dormant, letting it atrophy trying to secure the bag or secure security or safety, and then you're going to now speak, start speaking your mind. It doesn't work that way. You're never going to speak your mind if you follow that path. So those are my last words, Dr. Thunder. You didn't plug anything, so we're going to give you a plug, and then we'll end. All right. Well, I, I do have some um, pretty cool stuff uh, happening right now. Uh, now, one thing is it is second Thursday this week, and ordinarily that would be uh, uh, the Dr. Thunder Quartet live stream, but because I'm playing a concert series with the Columbus Jazz Orchestra, um, I will uh, be unable to do my regular live stream uh, on Thursday uh, with my band at the Blue Note Jazz Cafe, uh, and then followed by the Thunder's Thoughts episode. Uh, I'm still on the fence as to if I'm going to be able to do a Thunder's Thoughts that evening. It would be a late 
time, like 10, 15 or something if I was to do it, but it's likely that I will not. Um, but no worries. Uh, there's a lot of new interview content for you to view. Uh, one that I mentioned already was the interview I just did with Minister Jap. It was a great uh, discussion and um, very entertaining, uh, I think. So check that out. Go to my channel and check that out. Also, I interviewed last night the great and legendary Japanese pianist Keiko Matsui. Uh, she's played with Miles Davis and everybody. Uh, and that was a really great uh, conversation. That one's uh, available uh, on my channel. And tomorrow night I'll be interviewing Dr. Uh, Dr. Isria. Um, uh, <laughs> why can't I remember my man's <laughs> last name? Oh, yeah. Isria. Your, your, man, your man's going to kill you. You can't even remember his, your man's name. Isria Butler. Well, at least you remember the first name. <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Isria Butler, and uh, he's a great trombone bonist, um, and uh, he's also a department head in, in, a, in a school of music. Uh, heavy, heavy dude. Uh, I start, started playing with him. First time I played with him was with the Cab Calloway Band. Um, that's a iconic, historic band. Uh, the Howdy... Howdy ho, howdy ho, howdy hi, howdy 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 ho. You know this this yeah. I'm butchering it, but you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> um, stat band. So uh, so anyhow, uh, that's some stuff that's coming up, and of course, getting ish done with I can Doctor Thunder on um, on um, Tuesday, Tuesday next week. I had a few interviews that got canceled with, uh, with folks due to, due, due to illness. Um, uh, one with, uh, Mr. 1950 that's been rescheduled. Um, uh, everyone knows that Donovan Sharp, uh, was hospitalized. He's been out. He's, he's doing better now. So that interview will get rescheduled sometime. Um, I've got one with Paul Elam coming up, uh, and, uh, yeah. So lots of great stuff happening, uh, you know, keeping it moving. So come by and check your boy out. Indeed, indeed. So shout out to Jared. Shout out to Lee Roy. Shout out to Game Changer in the house. Yeah, you said you have, you're going to have the great and legendary, legendary Japanese pianist. I was like, well, well, let me know when you have the great and legendary Japanese penis on. But uh, <laughs> shout out oh. to... <laughs> No, no I, I had to do that because you know, I heard it. And I was like, oh, is it, do, "Do you make the obvious uh, third grade joke now?" But it just sounded oh, right. it was like the great and legendary Japanese pianist. And I was like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> "Anyways, <laughs> it, it turned out it was a lady too." But um, anyways, right. shout out to Game Changer in the building. Shout out to those of you who super chatted, and I believe it was just one of you that super chatted this time around. Uh, the five dollar super chat. To place it back here. Um, and whom left us that super chat, Dr. Thunder? Pernu men here. Mm-hmm. 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 All right. Till next time, we are gone. For me, I'll be here tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow, possibly with Joan reviewing another piece of content from popular culture. Giving you the good, 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 good game. Ladies and gentlemen, we're out. I travel by night and I travel by day I feel the breeze, I feel the call And I see the gravel and the grass by the way I hear birds and their mating call The toll on the road is a small price to pay Small price to pay for the saving of the race And so I say, I yeah, 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 yeah. People, what you wait
waiting for. Take one and leave one and take it to go. Make a decision and get on the road. Open your vision for the sun to shine on. Bamboo and a corn and a letter I wrote. Big ones and small ones and a pipe for a soap. The rhythms of time is the horse I ride on. Feel the breeze, I feel the call And I see the gravel and the grass by the way I hear birds and their meeting call The toll on the road is a small price to pay Small price to pay for the saving of the race And so I say, ay, 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 ay People, what you waiting for? There be raindrops and rainbows so clear Perhaps some snow angels may be a bear Anticipation in the heart casts a fog upon the road How far till the train stop, I wish I was there I glance at the paper just to be clear All the coming and the going that will be once was foretold I travel by night and I travel by day Feel the breeze, I feel the call And I see the gravel and the grass by the way I hear birds and their mating call The toll on the road is a small price to pay A small price to pay for the saving of the race And so I say, ay, 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 ay People, what you waiting for? sha na 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 no sha na 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 ne sha na 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 no I travel by night and I travel by day Feel the breeze, I feel the call And I see the gravel and the grass by the way I hear birds and their mating call The toll on the road is a small price to pay A small price to pay for the saving of the race And so I say, ay, 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 ay. People, what you waiting for?